Hi, my name is Matt Josie. I just want to take a couple of moments real quick to introduce our panelists, beginning with Dr. Jonas Winchell. Dr. Jonas Winchell received his PhD in molecular cell biology from the University of Connecticut and has been at the CDC for the past 13 years. He is the laboratory chief of the Ammonia Response and Surveillance Laboratory within the Respiratory Diseases Branch. His team of scientists designs molecular-based assays to test for respiratory pathogens around the globe and is the primary lab to respond to respiratory outbreaks. He has also been an adjunct professor in the School of Biology since 2003, teaching courses in virology and medical microbiology. Dr. Dave Bull is a health scientist with the Global Health Security Branch and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in Atlanta. Dr. Bull has worked with the CDC since 1997, holding several different international program management and policy positions. His international assignments with the CDC include technical assistant visits to countries including, but not limited to, Vietnam, Philippines, Serbia, Macedonia, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Morocco, Nigeria, Uganda, South Africa, Norway, Bolivia, and Argentina, just to name a few. <laughs> Dr. Bull earned his PhD in Health Policy and Administration from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he did his dissertation research on immunization uptake in Bolivia. Dr. Margaret Kozel is an associate professor in the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs here at Georgia Tech where she is currently the Associate Director of the Sam Nunn Security Fellows Program within the Center for International Strategy, Technology, and Policy. She recently returned to the Nunn School after serving as a Senior Advisor to the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. Before joining Georgia Tech, Dr. Kozel was a Science and Technology Advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Chemical, Biological, and Nuclear Defense. She holds a doctoral degree in chemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where she works on biomimetic nanostructure materials. Dr. Kozel has held positions previously at Stanford, Northwestern, and the Naval Postgraduate School, in addition to lecturing both here in the U.S. and abroad, founding a sensor company that researches biological, chemical, and explosive detection, and publishing the book Nanotechnology for Chemical and Biological Defense. Dr. Alberto Fuentes was born in San Jose, Costa Rica, and has lived in Chile, Mexico, Guatemala, and the United States. After completing his undergrad in economics at Yale, Dr. Fuentes earned his master's in city planning from MIT, after which he moved to Guatemala, where he worked for the Universidad Rafael Landivar's Institute of Economic and Social Research, as well as United Nations Development Program. He returned to MIT in 2009 to earn his PhD, doing his dissertation research on the processes of industrial transformation in Latin America at the Institute for Work and Employment Research in the Sloan School of Management. He obtained his PhD in September of this year and is currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Nunn School where he teaches courses on international development. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our panelists, beginning with Dr. Jonas Winchell. Thank you so much for the invitation to come here. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, before I start, I know we have a limited time for each of the segments that we have here, so I will go through quite quickly on some things, but if you have uh, questions at the end, I'm happy to entertain and go back through the, um, the slides again. Also, before I begin, although I work at CDC, as does uh, Dr. David Bull, uh, both of us are here not on behalf of the U.S. government or the Centers for Disease Control, so I need to get that disclaimer out of the way before I end up in the big house. Um, so, uh, without further do. Um, first, we should start on what exactly is a virus. And uh, we're dealing with something extremely small. So we're down into the nanometers, uh, and so that's 10 to the minus 9th meters. And um, it's a variety of sizes. Just to give you a perspective, polio is somewhere in the, in the 25 <coughs> nanometer uh, range, whereas HIV would, in, would be in 100 nanometers, uh, similar to influenza, which I'll show you, is about 100, 120 nanometers. And uh, I'll put that in perspective with Ebola when we get, get uh, a few slides in. Uh, viruses are made out of a core nucleic acid surrounded by a protein coat for protection. That is the essential component, components for all viruses. They're composed of non-structural and structural proteins. So what does that mean? Uh, to make an analogy to a house, kind of like your, your, your foundation and your, your walls and roof are all your structural proteins, and your non-structural proteins would be the inside components of your house and your furniture stove and, and microwave and things of that nature. Uh, viruses have the same kind of makeup uh, on a molecular level. 
The genome is either DNA or RNA. Again, these are nucleic acids. They are, are the genetic makeup of what makes a virus have specific traits and attributes. And some are very simple. They only code for a few proteins. And some of them steal envelopes from a cell. And so they are considered enveloped viruses. Now, one principal component that you must understand about viruses is they all absolutely require a metabolically active cell to infect. So you can't grow them on external media, like a, like a blood agar plate, like you would with bacteria. And so, to put it in perspective with sizes, we're seeing up in the upper, sorry, upper uh, corner here is a typical an animal cell, like your, your liver cell or your epithelial cell, would be huge compared to a, a virus, for instance. And down here is a, a schematic of a bacterium, and even bacteria can be infected with viruses, and those are called phages. Okay? So this is a relative scale of things, and even though both of these um, pathogens uh, or microbes can be actual pathogens and they're very tiny, they are nowhere near similar. Okay? Just because they're small, you can't group them together. Okay, so a virus and a bacteria are as different as a dog and a goldfish. I mean, they're very different. Okay? Uh, so some common viruses that you obviously are very familiar with, influenza virus, here's an envelope virus, and you can see around the outside here the spikes of the envelope, the glycoproteins. And um, you can see that the, this virus particularly is kind of amorphous, more like a kind of water balloon looking. Uh, whereas this one, HPV, which is a, a common source of uh, cervical cancer in women, this is um, more structured in a proteinaceous, right? This is all made out of different proteins, but it's very geometric. Okay, they are vastly different viruses, although they're both on the scale of nanometers. And here's a, a schematic of uh, a picture taken of HIV budding. This is your T cell here. And an infected T, T cell with various um, uh, HIV virions, virus particles kind of here. This one's in an exact process of budding out of a cell. So here are the classic uh, pictures that you'll find associated with Ebola. And you'll see they're long, right, like filaments, and spaghetti-like with kind of figure eights and, and eye hooks and the, those sorts of things. And uh, Ebola is a member of a class of viruses in the family called Phyloviridae. And that stands for, uh, named for filamentous, right? So it's very long and uh, filament-like. So these are extremely long. Um, they can be up to 970 nanometers long, whereas at the outset I told you most range of viruses are between 20 and 300 nanometers. This one uh, hugely exceeds that. The resolution, though, this is a very uh, small across here, such that these are still a virus that you cannot see under a normal light microscope, so you still need more higher powered uh, microscopy. Down here, you have an actual um, section uh, taken from an infected cell. These are your Ebola virions here, and these little ones that you see here, you have to imagine this thing is cut in a cross-section plane, so the virus is actually coming out of, the, out of the screen to you, right? So there's many different planes that you're looking at. But nonetheless, this is infected uh, tissue here. Here's a beautiful shot of an infected cell. Inside the cell, this is a really high-powered magnification. This is an organelle inside the cell. But all these little black kind of string particles that you see all layered here, are the virions, right? All, all the uh, Ebola viruses that are packed inside of one cell. So after a virus gets into the cell, it exponentially replicates. Okay, so it can you can inf infect a cell. For instance, polio. You can put one polio virus in the cell, and in four to six hours later, you can have ten to the six, one million coming out. Okay, and that's just one virion inside one cell. So if, I, if we look at closer at the virion itself, this is the virus, uh, the Ebola virus here, kind of snake-like that we said. And, and one, a couple things I wanted to point out here. One, this green uh, protein here is what wraps the nucleic acid. So inside here, Ebola is an <coughs> RNA virus. So this single-stranded piece of, of RNA is kind of protected inside this um, green protein core. The outside, is an envelope. So this is an enveloped virus. And a couple things I want to point out here is this kind of mushroom-shaped yellow thing, this is called a glycoprotein. So this is a sugar-coated -co protein. 
And this does two things to the virus. One, it allows it to bind the, the target cell, okay, attack the target cell and gain entry. The second thing is because it's covered with sugars, it makes it a really um, bad target for your immune system. It protects the virus, okay, because it's sugar coated and sugars are, are nice decoy kind of images for your uh, for the virus to evade your uh, immune system. And then inside this virus, it brings in different proteins. One of them is called a polymerase, and this guy is responsible for replicating the nucleic acid that's inside of here. Now, interestingly, here is the genetic um, uh, segment of the RNA uh, virus. And listed along here are the different genes. There's not many of them. And you can see this, this big one at the end is that L gene, which encodes for this polymerase. It does a lot of work for this virus, right? It's really crucial. But the other really important part about this virus is this area for the glycoprotein, this GP. So this GP, when it's read correctly all the way through, it makes a full protein and then gives you your product that you see here, which studs the entire virion and allows the entry. Okay, so this is important. But the polymerase does another trick. This virus is very sneaky. And Ebola only, right? It doesn't do it with its cousin called Marburg virus, which is in the same family. But within Ebola, what it does is it makes kind of like a um, partial form of this glycoprotein. And that's called a secreted gly glycoprotein. And what happens in, in this reading frame, which ends up with a truncated um, protein, is it doesn't encode for this little stalk region that inserts into the uh, envelope region. So in, instead, it's secreted out into the, into the body. And what that does is it provides a decoy for your immune system. And so in this busy slide, we have, if I focus you up here, we have an infected macrophage and dendritic cells. These are cells uh, that are part of your body that are in charge of protecting you early on in phases when you're infected. And what happens is, after this gains entry, so here's your Ebola virion, which will attach to a cell receptor here, and then fuse, this envelope will fuse with the cell membrane, and then the, the inside core will be dumped into the cell. And then what happens more importantly is this cell will become um, a, a reservoir for generating a lot of virus that'll come out. In addition to this, this cell is responsible for sending out a lot of these chemical signals called uh, cytokines. And these are incredibly potent. And that's what gives you a lot of your symptoms when you're sick, either with a general cold or allergies or those sorts of things. These are tiny chemical molecules that are released and give you all of your symptoms that you see. But what happens here is this becomes a source for virus. And what'll happen between these cytokines, it'll, it'll make other cells of your immune system apoptose, or what that's called as programmed cell death. So it'll actually kill these cells to die. And the other thing what'll happen is um, the, the released virions after this initial, oops, hit the wrong button. After the initial stage of infection, they will go to bystander cells. And these are in your endothelial cells which are aligning your blood vessels. And what'll happen here is these will become also uh, viral factories and, and release a lot of those virions. But what's also happening is you'll see just these red glycoproteins that are secreted with no virus. Well, what they do is they act as a decoy to absorb these black Y looking things. These are called antibodies. And those are there uh, to protect you. And your immune system will have generated antibodies to neutralize any foreign pathogen. And so what happens is the virus sends this kind of out there as, a, as a, like a red herring to sop up these antibodies. Therefore, the antibodies cannot actually target the actual virion itself. So it's a very sneaky virus. Now what happens inside this uh, endothelial cell is that it starts to downregulate these adhesion molecules. And why is that important? Because this is what causes um, folks to bleed out when they're infected with Ebola. Because during the infection, right, your, your initial monocyte or macrophage will become infected, release a whole bunch of these virions, which was a blow up here. This is your blood vessel here, okay? After that gets released, there's a lot of free virions now in your blood vessels. They will then infect the lining, which will be your endothelial cells. And what happens inside that endothelial cell these guys are tightly bound to each other with what's called tight junctions. It keeps them really, really tight so that your, your blood pressure stays high and you do not lose through vascular uh, leakage. 
But after being infected, Ebola downregulates the molecules that are supposed to keep these guys nice and tight. And so these guys start to degrade and slough off, and when that happens, you now have vascular leakage, and this is why patients hemorrhage. It's also why people go into shock uh, slowly. So you get this domino effect, right? You get uh, infection of the immune cells, and then this thing called a cytokine storm, where you get all these inflammatory chemical messengers being released. Then you get out of control viral replication, a decrease in four and five of your, of your immune response and your ability to combat the virus goes down. And then the virus continues to replicate unchecked and your vascular permeability increases, which allows the virus to then spread to all your other primary organs and tissues. So this is why uh, Ebola ends up hitting your liver and your kidneys and you get um, uh, basically a vascular le leakage and shock and hemorrhage. And that's what you see in most of uh, patients that go down that, that track. So some of the early um, symptoms here, in blue, you'll see it, most people first present with headache, fever, fatigue, muscle aches, those kind of things. And as people progress, they get into um, more of the diarrhea, vomiting, and some of the rashes that you see in the periphery. Uh, this next slide here shows more of a, a, a symptomology throughout the course uh, by days, right? So early on in the first week or so, you get that headache and fatigue and fever. And so this can oftentimes be confused for other things that you find in Africa, such as malaria. And then by day 10 and 11 and 12, you, you uh, continually kind of um, get to the final stages with the hemorrhages and ultimately an organ shutdown and massive internal bleeding. Uh, for those that are destined to recover, usually by about day 10 or 12, if you, you would start to show improvement. If you don't show it by 10 or 12, uh, at least in, in um, countries that don't have great health facilities, what usually happens is they progress and it, it's, it's uh, usually two to three weeks um, before they're dead. Uh, here are some of um, the classic uh, uh, symptoms after. You get a periphery kind of blood blisters, all, all um, kind of needle pricks. They don't coagulate because the virus also impacts your platelets and your platelets are incredibly important for blood clotting. So after it impacts the liver, you lose the ability to, um, to clot your blood. So even needle sticks and trying to get medicine to the patients or trying to start an IV line can be incredibly uh, uh, problematic. And here's some, some uh, blood from various orifices. Um, and I'm often asked, how do these viruses jump from, uh, how are they zoonotic? How do they jump from places where um, we're not used to seeing and then and all of a sudden we get a new virus or a new outbreak and these are perfect examples as to why that is uh, between uh, swine flus and other primate um, viruses jumping into humans. Um, of course, all the influenzas that you find in these open chicken markets and a lot of the cultural um, practices contribute to this. But um, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. David Bull and be happy to take questions at the end. I'm very glad to be here. I'm, uh, I work with the CDC and the uh, Global Health Security Branch. And for the last, what, two or three months, my whole life has been all about Ebola. I'm currently on the Ebola, the International Task Force. So I'm living and breathing this stuff. I want to just talk very briefly about some of the, the epidemiology part of it. Um, just some background. This is by far the largest <laughs> Ebola outbreak ever. Uh, we have more than 7,400 cases since March. Uh, over, almost half of them are, are dead. Um, it's the first time that this virus has appeared in these countries in West Africa. Typically in the past, it's been more towards Central Africa. The, the hot spots are Guinea, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and then they had some exported cases Actually, one exported case to Nigeria where several chains of transmission were established and contained. And uh, there was one uh, exported case to Senegal, the same thing. It was contained there. There was no secondary transmission. And, uh, both countries have passed uh, the 21-day uh, incubation period. Um, we current, I work for the CDC, as does Jonas, so we currently have 145 uh, CDC personnel deployed in, in the region. Um, 
hundreds and hundreds of, of international partners, Cubans, Russians, Chinese, Europeans, you name it, they're all over. Um, they're working in different areas, uh, the clinical care of patients, um, data management, uh, happy contact tracing uh, lab, and, and a lot of social mobilization types of activities. Here in the U.S., we've had four infected uh, healthcare workers uh, that have been treated. Uh, one's currently still in treatment, and we've also had the uh, Liberian patient that everybody's heard about in Texas. Um, here's a map of just during a two-week period. This is the number of cases reported. Uh, the, the darker red areas are where the highest incidence, uh, like 100 to 500 cases in, in those areas. So you can see there's some real hot spots within countries, but it's also, you know, kind of scattered throughout uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Um, the, the, the course of the disease, and Dr. Jonas has, has already talked about that. Uh, it is a zoonotic disease. The reservoir is thought to be bats, but uh, we're not, not definitive. But um, all this that we're seeing now is all human-to-human -human transmission. Um, it's kind of unique. It's not transmissible until the onset of symptoms, until a person actually has a fever or, or vomiting or whatever. Um, the, the amount of the virus in, in the body increases up to the point of death. So when a person is dead, is actually when they're most infectious, typically covered in sweat, blood, vomit, whatever. So the burial practices and how people deal with the bodies are very important. Um, and if a patient actually survives to about the 14th day, uh, there's a much higher chance they're, they're going to survive uh, ultimately. And then during their, their convalescent period is when the, the viral loads start decreasing. Um, for human-to-human -human, uh, transmission, we kind of categorize it into high-risk exposures, low-risk exposures. Um, the, the highest risk, obviously, is like things like needle stick injuries, uh, the direct care of an Ebola viral disease patient, uh, people that are exposed to body fluids, and many, particularly in the African healthcare setting, you know, a lot of these clinics um, where, where people first present themselves, you know, they don't have running water in many cases, they don't have personal protective equipment, I mean, just basic latex gloves. So a, a lot of healthcare workers are being infected when someone presents with a fever or vomiting or whatever. They don't know they're Ebola yet, but, uh, you know, it's transmitted to the, the person actually touching them. Uh, lab workers are obviously at risk, and, and as well as people that uh, kind of prepare the body for burial or relatives come and, you know, kiss or hug their, their loved one before uh, burial. Oops. Uh, Low-risk exposures are things, uh, just household, people living in the household, uh, kind of, you know, if you don't touch someone, that's a low risk, and uh, even if you're in close contact, um, we define that as within three feet or one meter, um, without personal protective equipment, these are pretty low risk contacts. And I think it's notable that, um, you know, for example, with people, there's been several cases of exported cases, people sitting on an airplane, sitting on a, a commercial vehicle, to date, none of their seatmates or people on these public vehicles have been infected. So that, that's an encouraging sign. It's, it's almost exclusively, um, you know, when you're in direct contact. Um, the goals of the outbreak response is, of course, to break the chain of transmission, that human-to-human -human chain of transmission. We do that by identifying patients and, and isolating them as quickly as possible, and you identify their contacts, um, kind of breaking them down into high-risk exposures and following them for an incubation period, which is 21 days. Um, we're doing the same thing in the U.S. now. There's 10 or so high-risk exposures in Dallas. 
typically it means fever checks twice a day. Um, patient care, there's very little you can do for an Ebola patient except supportive care. Uh, you know, keep them rehydrated, uh, treat them with antibiotics for any secondary infections, but there's no way to kill the, the virus itself. Uh, we do a lot of work in terms of uh, health education, and this is an opportunity uh, to enhance understanding. There's some new drugs that have been uh, used. Uh, some people are developing vaccines, and uh, there's a lot of uh, attempts to better understand if these investigational new drugs uh, actually work. Um, there are many components to the to the response, uh, everything from case management to transportation <coughs> of patients and bodies, lab work, the epi, the case, the case finding and identification, burial teams, etc. Priorities that our director gives us is obviously, you know, interrupt the chain of transmission, you know, break that person-to-person -person, uh, transmission. Uh, a lot of emphasis on, on contact tracing. The other thing is to prevent Ebola transmission to other countries. We do that primarily by airport screening, uh, temperature checks. We're using these little remote sensors. It looks like a little gun pointed at the passengers forehead and it gives you a, a reading. So anybody with a fever, of which, you know, when you go to Africa, a lot of people leave with a fever of some kind. So they, they're referred to secondary screening and, and uh, you know, to see if they've really been exposed to an Ebola patient. Um, this is, we have teams in, uh, in all the, the major airports in Africa, in Monrovia, Freetown, um, Conakry, Lagos. Um, contact identification, I think I've already covered that. The incubation period, as I said, is 21 days. If you, if the contact is, if there's no new cases after 21 days, you can start to breathe easier, as has been done in, in Nigeria and Senegal. Technically, the classic definition for the end of an outbreak is two incubation periods. So when, when we pass the 42-day mark, we'll be happy. Um, the infection control procedures for Ebola, you, you know, they're just basic. Anybody in the medical field, you know, you talk about standard precautions, contact precautions, droplet precautions. Um, it's not rocket science. This is why uh, Dr. Frieden on the television says, you know, the U.S. is equipped. We can handle this. Most any major hospital in the U.S. is capable of, of uh, providing care and preventing transmission. Um, so that's the, the message that we're, we're trying to get across. And also really emphasizing, I think the Dallas case was a good example that uh, uh, health care workers in non-Ebola settings need to have a heightened awareness and uh, really need to question a person's travel history and possible exposure. And I'm just going to end with some uh, of the treatment center uh, slides here. This Medicine Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, is a, a major provider of Ebola treatment where they actually care for the patients and give them supportive care. This is the type of facility they have, tents. Uh, you'll notice the big blue bucket that's probably filled with water bleach solution for, for decontaminating people. Um, the gentleman in, in the gown just came out of a, a high-risk uh, treatment area, and he's being hosed down with sprayed with uh, a bleach water solution. And um, this gives you an idea of how uh, the, the life of a patient that's convalescing or is, is, is not flat out in bed. They can actually come and, and sit their, their friends and family can sit about two meters away and they talk across the fence to each other um, and, and that's it, that, that's considered safe. And with that, I'll pass it over.
Okay, thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, and I'd also like to express thanks to Matt and the rest of the SIR undergraduates, um, great representatives of the fantastic undergraduates that we have in the Nunn School. Um, appreciate them organizing and putting this together. So I'm gonna shift a little bit from talking about some of the biological aspects and the epidemiology. I'm gonna focus on talking about the US government responses to the outbreak. A couple overarching themes. First of all, these responses demonstrate recognition that this is more than a biological event. That this is much broader in terms of consequences, in terms of causes. There's a number of underlying issues with respect to the US government response that have to do with both foreign state capacity and capability, or in this instance, the lack of capacity and capability in those states, as well as the challenges of capacity and capability in the US response. And this relates to why we're going to in invoking the military and having up to 4,000 troops being deployed as part of the US response. There's some big questions underneath that with respect to what constitutes a national security threat in the 21st century. Does a biological agent, a biological event, an infectious disease, constitute a national security event? President Obama and his administration have said unilaterally, yes. So we're looking at shifting in national security priorities. Another question that's uh, prompted here is, what is the purpose of the military? You have, right now, less than 500 US service members who've been deployed. We're looking at up to 3,200 army, uh, 32 service members from the army, looking at up to a total, I said again, of 4,000 military members. This is a humanitarian assistance disaster response. Is this a core purpose of the military is what it should be for the 21st century. Um, and then finally, a lot of this highlights differential in development. There's been a lot of investment in roads and transportation infrastructure, not necessarily commensurate investment in public health infrastructure, as well as education. So those are some broad themes. So on the 16th of September, President Obama came to Atlanta. He visited Emory, he spoke at the CDC. He outlined the US response broadly in a fairly short speech, much of which really was more directed at reassuring the population. It reiterated a lot of very well understood basic public health themes. He outlined in it the US strategy. The US strategy is a fourfold strategy. Number one, control the epidemic. Number two, mitigate second order impacts. And this is part of the recognition that is more than just material. The second order impacts are things like preventing a truly massive humanitarian disaster, those are the president's words, due to breakdown in economic social structures triggered by the infectious disease. Thirdly, coordinating US and broader global response. And then finally, fortify, fortifying global health security infrastructure in the region and beyond. So that's the US strategy, this fourfold strategy. Much of the language of sort of the intent and the underlying motivation was couched in terms about the responsibility of the United States as a global leader to protect. And so here we have an international relations, a policy concept, R2P that one might argue is being realized not in response to use of chemical weapons by Syria, not in response to any other humanitarian issue or conflict, 
but responsibility to protect R2P, manifesting most critically and most evidently in the response to the Ebola outbreak. It should also be noted that part of this had to come about because Liberia asked us to be involved. These are our sovereign states. Even if we recognize that there's a humanitarian disaster going on, the United States or any other sovereign state cannot interject ourselves until we are asked. The United States has a close relationship with Liberia. They requested our assistance. And then we, in response to that, as well as recognition of the national security threat, we are responding. At the policymaker level, we're seeing a concerted whole of government approach. This is from a, it's getting cut off at the bottom, from a briefing in Washington, D.C. on the 3rd of October, in which a number of the major players, the heads, or at least the representatives, are represented. You have General David Rodriguez, the commander of U.S. AFRICOM, DOD, Dr. Raj uh, Shah, who's the administrator of USAID, part of the State Department. He is, or USAID is the lead agency for the U.S. response. Lisa Monaco from the White House, uh, she's the Homeland Security Coordinator. Dr. Tony Fauci uh, from NIH, he's actually the head of the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases. And uh, the head of HHS, uh, Sylvia Burwell, CDC is part of HHS. So here we, we're showing that there's a unified, or a united, response within the U.S. government. And again, USAID is the lead. This is from the 1st of October in Monrovia. Again, we've got on the ground, from the policymaker perspective, individuals from the State Department, USAID, um, Nancy Lindbergh, she's the administrator for um, Foreign Disaster Assistance, representative from DOD, representative from the CDC, Thomas Kenyon, who is the uh, director for global health, all together addressing the U.S. activity in Liberia and the region. So a few uh, images from the USAID response, and it should be noted that USAID has been involved in responding for months. They did not start in September, just as the CDC has been involved in responding to this outbreak for months. Um, by August, USAID had already airlifted more than 16 tons of medical supplies including 10,000 sets of personal protective equipment that transferred in um, water treatment, electrical generators. There's current, there was a need for an electrical generator to power the main tr uh, treatment hospital in Monrovia. So talking, using this as an example of the lack of infrastructure that has to be dealt with. So it isn't necessarily high tech basic infrastructure. This is a safe burial team, been trained by USAID, and we have supplies being shipped in. Um, here's uh, disinfecting. And then in the bottom here we have part of a, a DART team, which is a disaster assistance response team. Uh, U.S. Army civil uh, engineer Andrew Hill, and what he's doing is he is literally drawing out on a piece of paper the plans for the 27, or one of the 27 Ebola treatment units that the U.S. military is going to help construct and train people, <coughs> train Liberians to work in. So from the DOD perspective, this is a hater mission, Humanitarian Assistance Disaster Response. 
This is not the first time the DOD has been involved in a hater, musician, a hater mission. Um, the response to the, to the tsunami in Southeast Asia, the response to the earthquake in Haiti, it's become an increasingly large part of the military's activities are responding to humanitarian disasters. This mission is being led by U.S. AFRICOM and the commander in charge is from U.S. Army Africa. Why is the DOD being brought in? Well, part of it is that issue of capacity and capability. It isn't that USAID or CDC lack experts. It isn't that they lack the skills or the knowledge. As the previous speakers articulated, talking about sending <coughs> hundreds of people, low hundreds. On the other hand, when you're looking at the military, you have hundreds of thousands of individuals who are able to deploy rapidly thousands of individuals. It's purely a capacity issue. And you also have capability within the military for logistics, for command and control, for coordination that may not be available in other parts of the U.S. government. <coughs> the DOD lead currently appears to be the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict, Mr. Michael Lumpkin. Lumpkin is a retired Navy officer, formerly a Navy SEAL. So with that context, this quote, just the complexity of running an ETU, a bullet treatment unit, was not apparent to me until I saw it firsthand. Someone who has spent a career focused on logistics issues, I'm not quite sure Navy SEALs would describe their careers as logistic issues, but we'll give that to him. I will tell you a lot goes into making the bullet treatment unit safe and effective. You know, so here we're looking at recognition of the complexity of setting these up and not just setting it up but getting it started so that it can be effective. Currently there are 205 uh, military members in Monrovia, there are 26 in Senegal, as I mentioned the um, current Plan deployment is 3,200 um, individuals from the Army. Those will mostly be civil affairs, engineers, and experts in logistics. Already have um, on their way individual CVs. This is a uh, Marine NCO briefing out Navy CVs. They are going in um, to build one of the first ETUs. This is a group of airmen from the 6th. 33rd Medical Group. They are going in to build a emergency medical support system. They're going to set up the facility. They're going to train the Liberians to work in the facility. And when infected individuals are brought in, they will be leaving. They're not doing the direct treatment. We've got airmen from the Kentucky um, Air National Guard. And here I have the only picture actually of, of Army folks. Um, this guy in civilian attire here. That's General David Rodriguez. I'm not quite sure why he's in civilian attire, but I have some hypotheses. He's the head of AFRICOM, the four-star general. So to this issue of capability and capacity, one has to, or one should, ask why is it within the DOD's ability to respond rather than USAID? Two questions like that, I always hearken back to former Secretary of Defense Gates' 2007 Landon Lecture. So this was a lecture he gave at, in Kansas in which, as the then sitting Secretary of Defense, he advocated for Congress to increase the budget of State Department and USAID in particular. 30 years prior to his tenure as Secretary of Defense, 
Gates had served in USAID as a civilian and he had seen the US domestic politics shift over the ensuing 30 years, in particular such that budgets had declined significantly at USAID and there were significantly fewer federal civilians, more of it was contracted out. And on the other hand, the, one of the few places in which there was investment in, in increases in the budget were in the DOD. So you see a shift in capacity to the DOD. So we have a couple maps that I want to put up here. So this is a map from the 27th of August. And here you can see basically the different treatment facilities that are available. Now these are all given sort of international um, labels. Really these are USAID. Blue is Office of Foreign Disaster Assistant. Uh, the red ones are the Global Health Program. U.S. has invested the lar largest amount. We've thus far invested more than $111 million, by far larger than any other entity or individual state. So this is the end of August. Here's comparatively, this is the most recent graph, most recent map, um, released the 1st of October. So in that time, significantly increased the number as well as the status, in particular these green ones that are now operational. Just in a month, when we want to do something, we can get something done, we can actually accomplish a lot when political will, when money, when capability and capacity is put towards it. So in conclusion, I want to um, hit on a couple different issues. The outbreak in Nigeria was mentioned already. The outbreak in Nigeria is thought to have been contained and stopped. One of the main reasons it was so effectively stopped, and it was, a, uh, it was an outbreak that occurred in Lagos, which is a mega city, has problems with infrastructure. What Nigeria had that Liberia, Senegal, and Guinea didn't have was they had a CDC polio eradication team on the ground. They had a CDC polio eradication team on the ground for probably close to 10 years. They'd been developing contacts with the locals, developing a network. So it was a relationships that were already established. And the polio eradication team could be basically shifted very quickly from focusing on polio, which is another virus, to stopping the outbreak of Ebola. Organizational structures and institutions matter, having pre-existing relationships matter. So a great deal of the attention that's been given in the US press has been to the deployment of the military. And as I mentioned, one of the questions has to do with what's the purpose of the military in the 21st century. Is responding to outbreaks of infectious disease what, the what we want the military to be used for? Is that a broadening of their capabilities that we want? Particularly for the US Army. These are issues that I am very interested in. So what is the purpose of our military going forward? Um, and finally, it was uh, reported recently that the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense, Andy Weber, has resigned. So this is a equivalent, roughly a four-star civilian equivalent, senior executive service. It has to be uh, approved through Congress, confirmed through Congress. He has resigned his position, this is what the rumor is, to become the deputy coordinator for the US Ebola response. So the coordinator is the former uh, ambassador to India. So here you have someone leaving a position within the Department of Defense that has historically been 
most connected to nuclear weapons, and particularly our deterrence capability through nuclear weapons. Shifting to responding to an international infectious disease outbreak. 21st century, what are gonna be the drivers for national security? With that, thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to my colleague Alberto. All right, thank you, everyone. Thanks for the invitation, first of all. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm actually going to follow Maggie um, with this initial claim, with this initial premise, which is very simple but very important. This is not just a health epidemic. This is a humanitarian crisis that we have here with broad economic, social, and perhaps even political consequences. To put it more concretely, Ebola is not only making people sick, it is a major disruption also in people's ways of life. It is shredding apart the economic and the social fabric of these countries. It is undermining the national institutions, the national political institutions, and it is wiping out the services that are provided by the state. And then since it's not clear to me that we should be comparing Ebola to things such as the MERS outbreak in the Middle East or H1N1 in Mexico, where you didn't have any kind of these kind of broader environment or humanitarian concerns. I think the better comparison here, the better source of guidance, comes from other cases of humanitarian crisis, such as the Haitian earthquake that Maggie mentioned, or the 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami. Now the distinction is important because a humanitarian crisis like the one that is unfolding in West Africa as we speak requires a much broader probably longer-term response than one exclusively focused on an infectious disease epidemic. So what I want to argue is that based on these previous cases of humanitarian crisis, the broader response should involve and should eventually be led by the national states of the affected countries. While initially the international community should certainly place a significant emphasis on controlling the outbreak itself, the response to, to Ebola should also simultaneously focus on ensuring that the national states of Liberia, of Guinea, of Sierra Leone can assume the longer term responsibility of dealing with the humanitarian consequences of this outbreak. However, before I talk about the response itself, it is important to recognize that in their current forms, these three national states can most readily be considered either failed states or very fragile states. So as this chart shows here, the three countries have some of the most fragile states on earth. These are countries that are coming out of civil wars, out of bloody civil wars, and their states have certainly not yet recovered. Nor have the national economies and the living conditions of most of the populations in these countries. You can also see here that the countries rank among the lowest in the world when it comes to human development. <coughs> now given this context, the kind of knee-jerk response that you usually hear is that we should demand that the international community step in and aggressively take control of the situation. Now I should say I partially agree with this thought insofar as a coherent international response is necessary. And certainly, you know, the national states of Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia at this time lack the necessary resources and the necessary capacity to face this health outbreak, which, by the way, threatens not only the local population, but the population of the world at large. But in doing so, in advocating that we have this international response, we should clarify what our goals are. If the only goal here is to stop this epidemic, then perhaps a largely internationally-led intervention is warranted. But if our goal is not only to stop this particular epidemic, but also address the broader, and I would say perhaps more complex, humanitarian crisis that it has created, then we should be aware that this, pro this 
approach, this idea of involving only international responders, carries important risks. Now, as the case, the case of the Haitian earthquake suggests, for example, such a unilateral international response creates an enormous dependence in the countries on foreign aid and foreign NGOs. So essentially, you have this, for these foreign organizations assuming the tasks of the state. Now, that might be okay while those organizations are in the country. But once they leave, they live in enormous vacuum, an enormous void, right? And the state, which is so weak, is really unable to take over those responsibilities. Now, the departure of these international organizations then creates all these questions. For starters, who will fill that void? And we should consider that, especially in countries such as Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, where this infection, where Ebola, has killed a number of the most educated people in the country, right? Who is going to take charge of actually rebuilding these countries and ensuring their recovery once this epidemic is controlled? Now again, these questions are especially relevant in these countries that are plagued by Ebola, where in the recent past, violent insurgent groups <coughs> filled similar voids, similar vacuums, and triggered civil wars. Moreover, the post-war recovery in all of these countries is still very much an unfinished task. The weakening of the national state by bringing in all these international organizations and thinking that they're just gonna perform all the tasks that the national state should be performing will only delay the long-term recovery of these countries. Now for this reason, as I said before, a response to a humanitarian crisis of this magnitude must involve a central role for the national states of Liberia, of Guinea, and of Sierra Leone. Now again, I should emphasize that I'm not advocating that these international aid agencies, that the international response, that the NGOs withdraw from active participation in controlling the outbreak. Rather, what I am saying is that as part of the response to the broader humanitarian crisis, we should seriously emphasize the importance of also building up the capacity of these national states. And doing so requires involving these national states in the response effort itself, not only transferring all the decision-making to outsiders. Now this, I really believe, represents not only an urgent need in these countries, but might also actually even offer an opportunity to contribute to their long-run development, which I hope is what we care about here. Now in this process of inclusion and construction of the national state, I see two major avenues that we can pursue. Both of these have strengths and weaknesses. The first is to build up the traditional European version of a state. You know, and here you would have to go about recruiting a competent, trained bureaucracy, including that bureaucracy and response teams, finding different sources of funding for national ministries, etc. Now, under this first strategy, the idea would be that the foreign intervention force would gradually devolve power to the increasingly functioning state. And this strategy might avoid leaving behind a void, which is a major concern, but I should note that it also carries important risks. Most prominently, building a state from the ground up like this is no easy task. It might take too long to rebuild, particularly when we have these tight time constraints of a humanitarian crisis. <coughs> Furthermore, I think the history of these countries offers us a second concern. Traditionally, a small elite, often disconnected from the social and political life of the rest of the country, has controlled the state. Therefore, strengthening this existing state in these countries, with its headquarters in the capital, with its bureaucracy drawn from the more educated, wealthier members of society, might not necessarily represent the national interest. It might actually entail this kind of serious breach of democracy and of representation in these countries. Now, I think an alternative approach here involves reconceiving the state and pushing beyond the standard European-based understanding and its formal structure of national ministries. Now, the argument here is that we should focus on a more contextually derived version of the state, 
one that is better suited to the local conditions of these countries. Now what the second alternative suggests is that the construction of the state uh, should involve what have been until now non-state local level actors and their power structures. So here we can think of local chiefs, of community organizations, even non-state health response teams. These non-state actors, all of them, have been in many cases stepping in to take on the task that the state would have traditionally performed in the societies. Some have learned through the experience of facing this Ebola epidemic and become relatively adept at dealing with not only its health consequences, but more broadly again, its humanitarian consequences. Now the construction of the state and its involvement in the response to the health and humanitarian crisis could actively include these non-state actors. It could bring them into the fold of the state and give them high-level responsibilities in responding to the humanitarian needs created by the Ebola epidemic. Now again, like the previous alternative, this alternative also offers benefits and risks. Among the benefits, we can talk about how we're building here on local cases of success, right? We can also talk here about how we could more swiftly create a state. You know, you're not building it from the ground up, you're taking what's already existing, so you need to build it more swiftly to face the humanitarian crisis. And lastly, that could also involve adopting a much more democratic structure for the state, what that's not only representing the elites in the capital, but a much broader swathe of the population. However, like the other one, this approach also has its pitfalls. More importantly, I think there's a risk here of real internal rifts between these different groups, which could undermine not only the national cohesion, but the capacity of the state. Now in sum, and to conclude though, the main, the main point I want to make brings me back to this initial premise that Maggie made before. This is a humanitarian crisis. We should react to it as such. It demands a longer-term response, one that I think can only be adequately provided by a coalition that includes the national states of this country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fuentes. Um, I want to invite all four of our panelists to come up real quick, um, and we're going to enter a 10-minute question and answer session. I know that we've already gone over our 7 p.m. time limit, um, so if you have to leave, then please do so at your convenience. Um, but what I'm going to ask you to do is if you have a question, please raise your hand high. Um, speak into the mic, speak audibly, identify yourself. If you're a faculty member or student, if you would just identify your department, um, and then pose your question, or if you're a member of the community. Um, so with that, I will hand the mic over to Edda, and she will give it to somebody for a question. The discouraging thing seems to be that, that we talk about vaccines, but my understanding is, not being a virologist, but that it takes years and years to, to develop a vaccine. How, how do we address that? Thank you. My name is Kenneth Brown. I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> countries uh, and there's just no incentive for them to develop stuff like that and 
you know, as a result, it's only been through military contracts, Defense Department contracts that have resulted in a few, like ZNAP, experimental drugs, and uh, some vaccine research, but it's, it's usually it's just through government investment. And in this situation, where a neglected disease has suddenly become world, you know, front and center, um, there's a lot of efforts to, uh, you know, provide the incentives, financial incentives to make it happen. So there's a lot of work, and it's a very complicated uh, regulatory environment with experimental use of authorizations, investigational new drugs, and things like that. That a lot of hoops. But there are trials that are going to begin within a few months. So to further what my uh, colleagues were saying, you know, this highlights the need for continual investment in basic research. Investment in things like understanding host response. You know, that is, how does the human body respond to infectious disease? Understanding pathogenesis. This is not something that can be fast-tracked. This is long-term, sustained investment in basic research and the translational medicine. Um, 2008, in the Department of Defense, there was an uh, unprecedented investment. It was called the Transformational Medical Technology Initiative, meant to invest $5 billion over the course of five years to understanding some of these underlying underlying biological um, systems, uh, types of interactions, um, because of a whole number of issues that had to do with politics and programmatic organization, not the science, but the underlying politics. Congress cut the funding, eventually cut it down to less than $100 million per year, Sounds like a lot, but when you're trying to overcome multiple diseases that do not have either pre-treatments or therapeutics as treatments that you can give afterwards, that's not a lot. So we need to have the political will to continue to sustain basic research within the United States. And then I would also ask the panelists if you guys can make sure to speak in your microphones and audience members, um, if you can identify whether your question is addressed to a specific member of the panel or just everybody sitting on the panel. So let's take you down with the shirt. Thank you. My name is Josh and I'm a Georgia Tech alumni from uh, 2009. Um, my question is with this being a national security issue now, um, my question is, if one of President Obama's, um, one of the strategies that he's employing is to contain the disease, is why has um, air travel not been shut down to this area? I mean, obviously this is, you know, you might be intruding on a commercial or the private sector, but when it becomes a national security issue, why have things not been suspended? You saw that in Israel after the war with Hamas, where um, air travel was suspended to Israel during this humanitarian crisis, so why is this not going on right now to prevent the transmission to the United States? I'll take that. It's a great question, because isolation and quarantine are traditional ways of responding. So the analogy to the very short-lived suspensions of flights into Ben-Gurion is a little problematic. I mean, that was, there was concerns because Hamas rockets were coming close to Ben Gurion. So that was a very specific, very narrow area. Now when we're looking at the potential of sort of how do we quarantine and isolate the United States? Well, okay, so let's say we stop all flights from West Africa. Well, there haven't been direct flights from Liberia since 2008, so you can't really stop direct flights from Liberia. That's issue. Flights from of people coming in from Africa most commonly go through Europe. So are we going to stop all flights from Brussels, London, Paris, Germany, Amsterdam? No. 
um, you know, it becomes an issue of logistics. So that's one piece to it. More importantly, as has been demonstrated, the underlying science of containing the, F, the outbreak is not the issue. So we would do more harm both to ourselves as well as to somewhat unstable and being more destable nations by stopping any, trying to stop any air transportation, any air traffic. It's an idea that on surface, surface makes total sense. But then when you start peeling back the issues, one, you find it's not implementable, but more importantly, it really wouldn't be effective. Yeah, and I, I could add too that the, the idea of a, a cordon sanitaire, you know, a quarantine or you know, a security area, it, it just doesn't work. It's been tried in the past, and it usually has the direct opposite effect. Where if you, you know, said nobody leave here, the first thing that you're going to want to do is, is leave, and that's what's happened in, in, in a lot of these rural villages where previous outbreaks have, have happened. The government would try to impose a. a or on Sanitaire, and, and you know, people just flee and actually spread the, 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 the disease. Um, it's also, it's not scientific, you know, in the sense of, you know, to stop the disease, you have to break the chain of transmission. And by just throwing a circle around the area and letting everybody die within the circle, you know, that's not the way to do it. Uh, in, in, on an airplane, you know, to date, of all the outbreaks that have occurred since 1976, the Ebola outbreaks and the Marburg outbreaks, you know, there's never been a case of someone picking it up from an airline passenger, for example. So, it, it, politically, it might make sense. I remember when H1N1, the, the, the flu that swept through the Mexico and the U.S., um, there was a plane load of Mexican citizens quarantine in China, you know, just because they felt like a political need to do so, but, you know, it wasn't helpful. It kind of does a quick follow-up. So, based on just the simple idea of, of just the simple idea of having a passport, I mean, I, I just don't see that, I don't, I'm not going to argue at all, but saying if someone has a passport that is then stamped that says, I've been to this country, there's no way that the U.S. government or there's no, they're not the political will to basically prevent these people from getting on a plane after being to these contaminated areas and then boarding a plane to the United States. They're, obviously, you had, we had mentioned and discussed that it's true, it would be much more difficult to stop flights from Europe or from wherever, but there's not a way to, we have all this technology to look at a passport, yet we can't look at it and stop the person from getting on the plane. Well, actually, we can and we do uh, in, in the affected countries in Monrovia, the, the international air, air connection from Monrovia, Freetown, and Conakry. Um, we, CDC has staff on the ground there doing airport screening, temperature sensing. Uh, there's the local, um, I mean, the national governments have contact lists of people that are known to have been exposed. They, they have kept some people off planes. In the screening process, it's similar to the way DHS has a do not board list in the U.S. for usually terrorism type of things. Um, but the, um, um, but also the airport screening actually checks for symptoms, people that are symptomatic with fever or other physical signs. So that is thousands of people All right, I think we have time for one more question here in the back, um, and then we're going to call it a night.
Hello, my name is Alberto. I'm a senior industrial engineering student. I'm actually gonna be working um, with the CDC uh, for my senior design project um, with regards to the deployment of the burial teams. So I'm here to learn a little bit more. Um, I want to I want to learn how important these burial teams are because uh, I know that um, a lot of people get infected while getting in contact with the dead bodies. And I want to know what are the resources that we have um, for the burial teams and what are the main challenges for it in terms of, of transportation or capacity of resources. When you're highlighting a critically, you're highlighting a critically important piece. I mean, it's known that at least 465 individuals were infected at one single funeral. This is one of the first cases that was actually happening in sort of the, the triangle area. So burial customs and breaking that train of transmission is a critical scientific-based, implementable step. Now, so the other uh, questions that uh, you asked, um, I don't know the specifics. So, so your question was, what is the training that may go on at CDC before teams are deployed? Yeah, how, how limited are the, resor the resources that you, you need specific? Sure, okay, so uh, Ebola is, is a biosafety level four <coughs> agent, as you may know, and so there are only a limited number of people anywhere in the world that are actually qualified and trained to work with BSL-4 level agents. So you can see quickly how we would um, be exhausted of just the scientific skills and skill sets that are uh, associated with those folks. So what they've done is they've tapped folks that are um, laboratorians that are trained with BSL-3 agents, for instance, HIV, um, anthracis, uh, Francisella tularensis, other agents that are more at the BSL-3 level so that they at least have a, uh, a higher level of qualifications to deal with these kind of agents. And what happens is they're going to um, uh, gather the teams of, of those that are qualified, at least at that level, and pair them up with one person who is a BSL-4 trained scientist and come up with teams like that. But even with the BSL-3, you get quickly limited, um, which is why they called on other institutes to help and uh, folks at, at, uh, uh, in, in DOD labs as well to assist. And so those are kind of where the limited gaps you know, are, are for us, um, uh, at least that right down the road here in Atlanta. And, and in, in country training uh, for burial teams is, is taking place. Uh, MS, it's at Saint Frontier is the, the, the lead agency, but uh, they, you know, sometimes recruit survivors who have, are thought to be immune. Uh, they, they still wear all the protective gear, but uh, uh, for people that are ostracized from their community, but otherwise well. They're ostracized because of the, the stigma of having had Ebola. They actually um, are, are pretty good uh, candidates to be employed on burial teams. Um, but it's it's a very dangerous job. You know, the, the, the body is most infectious at time of death when blood is everywhere and uh, the highest concentration Virus, so it's, it's a very dangerous procedure, and, and uh, you know, bodies are, um, you know, in, in Liberia, they have a hotline where people call to report a body in the street, and there are many, many bodies in the streets, and a team comes, sprays them down with a bleach solution, you know, and, and picks them up in a plastic bag, and takes them to be buried. It's, very countercultural. People have a hard time accepting seeing their, their loved ones treated like that. But, um, it's <coughs> becoming acceptable. People realize they have to do that. Uh, in the U.S., the CDC's, uh, in collaboration with MSF, have started a training program in Aniston, Alabama, for um, volunteers and personnel that are American citizens that are going abroad. Missionaries, uh, uh, public health service personnel, people are going to be staffing Ebola treatment units. It happens 
every week now we have a three-day training um, and uh, basically uh, teaching people how to <coughs> don and doff protective gear and that sort of stuff uh, safely. Awesome. Well, with that, um, I think we're going to cut it off there. Uh, can we just give one last round of applause for our panelists? We are so grateful for you guys coming to your time and expertise. It really means a lot. Um, we'd also like to thank the rest of Sigma Yoda Row for hosting this, um, and also you guys for being in attendance tonight. Um, hope you guys have a great night, and feel free to come up with any questions to our panelists.